Jill asked me to do this because she thought that even if you can't use these specific ideas, that maybe it would help you um, get ideas of things that you could use to teach uh, uh, concepts that you need to use in your room. So this whole thing got started last year. Um, I use this resource from the Learning by Design. And um, I was teaching the synthesizing. And they have this picture of a puzzle, and then they put it together so that they take these different pieces of information and put it together and save it in a new way. And I thought, OK, so instead of showing this picture, why don't I bring a puzzle in? So I brought in a puzzle. And I only I didn't show them the finished picture. And I started out with a few key pieces. Um, and I just let them look at them. We discussed what they saw. And they saw green and they saw hearts. Um, white, a little bit of green, polka dots. And then this thing that looks like it might be a flower pot that has a dead plant in it. Okay, so we say, okay, so what do, you, what do you see? We, you know, went over again. What do you see here? And what do you see? Okay, so then I give them all the pieces and I let them put it together. And um, when they get done, then they right away. The first thing they always say, it's a snowman. It's a snowman. I knew it. They knew it. They knew it. <laughs> and um, so then I say, okay, but when you started, you had this piece of information, and you had, you know, we list these pieces of information. Now, when you put it together. You can say it in a new way. Oh, I have a snowman. So they, they got the idea of what synthesizing was. And it never failed. If I asked them, what is synthesizing, they could all tell me, oh, it's like a puzzle. You take those pieces of information, you put it together, and you say it in a new way. They could always do that. They couldn't necessarily synthesize the material that they read, but they knew what synthesizing was. And I thought, OK, if it worked so well with that strategy that they're supposed to work on, why don't I try it with other things? Okay, because it seemed to me that when I was teaching these strategies, each every two weeks they start a new one. And I teach a strategy, and then the next week I'd say, okay, we're gonna work on another strategy. And these pieces of information were just floating in their heads. And they had nothing to grasp onto. You know, I, I don't quite have my chemistry down, but it seemed like, it, aren't there like ions that float around that are trying to find things to attach to? And they couldn't attach it. You know, and it'd be like they'd get, they'd start, oh yeah, this, I kind of remember that, and then it would float off again, and they would, it wouldn't make any sense to them. And then I felt like I was kind of, they, they couldn't understand the concept completely, they couldn't keep the strategies straight, and I felt like I was the peanuts teacher, the wah, 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 and they, weren't getting any of it. So I thought, okay, if it works so well with this synthesizing, I'm going to try to come up with um, other objects to help them get all these strategies. So I started to think, went through, this is the third grade book, went through, and each concept or each strategy that they work on, I tried to think of something that would help them understand. Tried to think of, okay, where do we do this thing in other ways? in our life that that could carry over for them into reading. So making connections, I thought of Legos. They connect Legos. They literally connect that will help them remember the word connections. So this is the first one of the year. So I start out reading a book, and all I do is say the words. There's no fluctuation in my voice. There's no emotion. There's no stopping and thinking, I just model reading that book. And as I'm reading that book, I just am reading it, and I'm just talking plain, and I just stick this on here, and I don't even tell them why this is here, and I'm just like reading, bored, but reading, you know. And then I get done, and I'm like, okay, so what do you think? How was, how was the reading? Oh, that, that's, they don't want to be mean. It's too early in the year. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. So then I say, well, if we're really reading, we aren't just saying words. Our brains are constantly thinking as we're reading. We have to constantly be thinking. And one thing that we like to do is make connections. So this time I read and I use emotion, I use enunciation, I use, you know, I do a much better job and I stop and I say, oh, I've done this before. I know exactly what those characters are feeling. And I start doing it. And as I'm reading there, 
then I start building something that they think is really cool. We did this again in December, so there's a Christmas tree inside. But um, anyway, then we get done, and I say, okay, if these are our brains when we're reading, what do you want your brain to look like? This, this, this. Okay, then we're going to constantly be thinking as we read, because if we're really reading, we're thinking about what we're reading. So we then start focusing in on connections. And if you notice, there's a lot of these green blocks. Mm -hmm. And what we do is I put two blocks in front of each of my kids. One of them is a green, and then one of them is another color. I didn't have enough of another color. So the green was always what they read in the book. So they have these sitting in front of them. And when they're done reading, then they say, in the book, I read that the dog ran away. My connection is, and as they're saying their connection, they literally put it together and say, my connection is my dog ran down the street the other day and I had to run down and chase him. So then they literally are making the connection. So they, they actually love touching it and doing it. And then I have a wean them off of the real Legos and I have a, just a little sheet here that this is um, in the book I read and that reminds me of and it has the arrow showing the connections. So we have, I tried to have something literal that they could touch and then some way that they could transfer it into paper and then also be able to tell me. So that was the making connections. Then we went on to asking questions. And of all of them, the um, things I've come up with, I think my asking questions one is probably the weakest, but the kids like it, so then that's what really matters. But um, I take out the Curious George doll and I ask him, what do you know about Curious George? And they say, he's curious. I'm like, yeah, he's always asking questions. So I always take their curious and put it into asking questions. And then I get out a few Curious George books and I read passages where it always says George was curious. And then it always lists some of the questions that he had. And we talk about, okay, if Curious George was a reader, what would he do the whole time he's reading? Well, he'd ask questions. So we do that. We read a passage, and then I say, okay, what questions did you have? And then as they're sharing their questions, they actually get to hold Curious George. You wouldn't believe that second and third graders, even third grade boys, love to hold <laughs> Curious George. And some of them would be killed. They'd say, if Curious George read this passage, he'd say, because they didn't want to be, you know, the ninnies who were, I don't know, they loved putting it into Curious George's words. But um, anyway, that was a way that they could think about, okay, i got to be asking questions. Um, and they just thought they had all the power in the world when they were holding Curious George. Um, the next strategy was inferring. And what I do when I uh, was teaching the inferring, I'd go ahead and earlier in the day and I'd trash my classroom. My, my little room is all the way upstairs where the um, principal's office used to be. And I'd tip over chairs and i knock books off the shelves and i take stuff off my desk and i scribble uh, pictures on the marker board and, you know, Mrs. Lonnie is mean and I misspell words and, and um, I took some of my pictures and doodled on them and so, yeah, so it looks like somebody was out to get me. And so I, I don't get to work with kids in my room, so I, I go to the classrooms and I say, guys, something really bad happened in my room today, but I need to, uh, I decided before I call the police, I'd go ahead and use this for good and I'm going to teach you a reading strategy of it. So we go up and then they're all, oh, I can't believe they're just in shock. And on the board, I have um, covered up or overwritten some of the stuff that the vandals did. And it's something like this, but instead of the book, I have a magnifying glass. So what we do is we look around the room and we write what we saw in the magnifying glass. And then we say, okay, what does that make us think about the criminals? And then why would you think that? So like one of the things that the kids came up with was, oh, they had to have climbed in the window. I'm at the highest part of the <laughs> We had to climb in the window because the door would have been locked. You know, so so they're saying, okay, I saw that the door was locked, so I think they climbed in the window. And why do I think that? Because that's the only other way in this room. So they were inferring as we did it. Okay, so then the next day, I show them this chart. Oh, and I talk about how uh, 
criminals do not go, oh, Mr. Policeman, it's me, it's me, I did the crime, that the policemen have to put all this together and figure things out. The criminals don't tell them. So then the next day we have this sheet, and I have these short little nursery rhymes that are silly rhymes. Um, uh, one of them is, twinkle, twinkle, little star, I'm going to try with all my might to keep my jammies dry all night. Okay, and the, and the kids love it because obviously they're inferring that the child goes to the bathroom in their pants at night. And so with doing that, we talk about how they figured something out that the author didn't tell them. Just like the criminals didn't tell the police, the police had to figure it out um, based on the information that they had. So they really enjoyed seeing the vandalized room. You know, if we're ever talking about inferring again and they can't remember it, I'll say, remember when the classroom was trash? Oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. It really helps them connect it. Okay, so then monitoring understanding. Um, with this one, it's probably the one that takes the most explanation, but it really seemed to work for them. Um, we talk about, I always ask them, so what, when do you go, why do you go to the doctor for a checkup? And without thinking, they say, you go because you're sick. I'm like, no, 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 for a checkup. Why do you go for a checkup? And then they have to really sit and think, well, to make sure everything's okay. I'm like, yeah, they go just to make sure everything's okay. What happens if they find out that everything isn't okay? You know, they run different tests, right? They don't do the same tests. So, you know, they do this, they pull these things out, they do this. And we talk about how there's different tests for different things and that they are going to run the, those tests to find out if there's anything wrong. If there's nothing wrong, you're good to go, right? What if they find out there's something not quite right, even though you didn't know it? Well, they're going to give you medicine. They're going to give you something to help you get better. And so I say, okay, it's like that in reading. When you're reading, you need to stop every once in a while and give yourself a checkup, just like you go to the doctor. And if I ask my kids, I, I say, you always have to ask yourself, did that make sense to me? Did I understand? My kids are going to say, yes. Yes, I understood. Every time. And I'm like, okay. So you went to the doctor because you thought you were healthy, but you just wanted to make sure. Well, you think you're understanding this, but we want to make sure. So let's give ourselves a couple little, a little test. And I always ask them to tell me, who did they read about? What happened and why? And if they can tell me those three things, then they were in good health. They can read on. And if they can't, what do they need to do? So in, in this learning by design flip chart, they have these lists of six things that they can do when they don't understand. And so we go through those six things. And we actually made a sheet here that has the six things over here. And then up here they write the page that they lost comprehension, where they didn't understand. And then I tell them they can try any of these things they want in any order that they want. It doesn't matter. Just go ahead and try it. And if they tried it and it didn't work, I want them to put a check mark next to it. If they tried it and it worked, I want them to put a star there. So then when we fill up the page, then we just kind of look at what they used. Which strategies did they use? And then which ones were most effective for them? Because they're not all the same, you know, obviously not all kids use the same strategies as effectively. So then they found out what really worked for them. I like that. So well, that's the first week. Then the second week, I start saying, okay, what happens if um, I have an appointment for a checkup next week, but I end up getting sick today? Do I wait to go next week? No, 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 you go okay. Okay, same thing happens. You don't have to wait till you get to the end of the page to see if you're understanding. Okay, if you figure out, whoa, I don't understand what I just read, then stop right there and do your fix-up strategies. So. That was how the doctor's kit helped them understand their monitoring understanding. All right, so then creating images. They love creating images. I always talk about how when we read, I, I don't understand how some people could possibly not have a mental image of what they're reading going on in their head. I don't, I, I don't know. It seems like that has got to be a natural thing. Um, but I don't know if they're not aware that they're doing it or if they, if they really can do it. I don't, I don't know if it's possible to read without getting a picture. But either they don't do it or they're not aware. So we talk about how when they read, they should be having this movie playing in their head, and it's way better than anything that they've ever seen in the movie theater. So when you go to the movie theater, 
you can only see it and you can only hear it. But if you're imagining that story in your head, you can imagine what it would be like to taste it, imagine what it would like to be feeling that, to be feeling what's going on in the area around you. Um, all that, and how much better that image is in their head than a movie. So then, we talk about what we could use to help us remember all that there is in that image. I always say, I'd love to be able to just open your head and look at that picture that you have in your head, but I can't do it, so you have to tell me everything that's there. So we use Mr. Potato Head to have them tell me the different parts of their image. Okay, so let's start with... I'll hand out the different parts. Okay, Jessica, you're going to tell us the, what you saw in that passage here. You're going to tell us what you heard in that passage. So they read a passage, and then Jessica will tell us what she saw, and she gets to put the eyes on Mr. Potato Head. And then Sherry will tell us what she heard in that passage, and she gets to put the ears on. So then they're getting this full image, okay, what they smelled, what they tasted, what they heard, and then we have the arms, what they felt. And then for the feelings inside, I have these little strips of paper, and they write what the characters were feeling emotionally, and they stick it inside Mr. Potato Head. Okay, so they absolutely love playing with Mr. Potato Head. And it helps them get that whole image in there. You know, when I give them a running record, and I ask them, so tell me about the image they have in your head, they can tell me what they saw. And then I'll say, okay, so do you remember, you know, is there anything more to that image? Okay, do you remember Mr. Potato Head? Oh yeah, okay, so I heard this and I saw this and then they get, they remember it. Now my problem this semester is trying to wean them off of the Mr. Yeah. Potato Head reminder and getting them to just do the, tell me about the images in your mind. But, a yeah, whole semester to do that, right? <laughs> okay, so that's the creating images. Um, they seem to enjoy that one a lot. Okay, then the determining importance. Um, I talk about how they have to be able to tell the nuts and bolts of the story, the very basic thing. And then I have to explain, you know, when somebody says get down to the nuts and bolts, what do they mean? I have to explain that to them, you know, the very basic important information. You know, if we, if we put together this tricycle and we take out the bolt that's holding the tire in it, what's going to happen? Totally fall apart. Okay. Well, that's what you need to be able to do when you're reading. You need to be able to pick out the nuts and bolts. So. I have this bag of all sorts of things in it. Okay, they're just little objects. There's nuts and bolts in there. There's a button that's a, um, a uh, sunflower, there's a teddy bear, there's a, parts of it, part of a seashell, a dime. You know, interesting things. I just lay it out there and I just let them look at it. And they're all, oh, this is cool, this is cool. Nobody picks up the nuts, nobody picks up the bolts. I pick up the things that look interesting. And then I say, well, this is your brain. Your brain has got to be able to pick up the nuts and bolts of the story. It's got to be able to pick up the important information. So then we run it over, and then obviously we're picking up all the nuts and bolts and the very basic important information. And all this interesting stuff that was so distracted to us didn't get picked up. So then they're seeing, okay, that's nuts and bolts. And I always make the sound of the, of the stuff getting sucked up by the important, or by the brain, by the magnet. And this year, it seemed like the kids had the easiest time picking out the nuts and bolts. And learning by design, I'm not sure which level of grade it is, but um, they say it helps the kids determine the important information by, if you take that piece of information out, does it drastically change the story? Does the story still make sense? So that's, we ask that, you know, what did you think was important? If you took that out of the story, would it drastically change the story? So I have a little worksheet of that. Um, I just put a magnifying glass, or a magnifying glass, magnet on this side and then a seashell on this side because one of those pieces over there was a seashell. And then they can list what was important and they can list what was interesting. All right. Then, synthesizing. I talked about with that jigsaw puzzle. And um, using fix up strategies. Now, that's the one thing that is not a comprehension strategy. Um, but very, very important. And I walk into the classroom wearing my tool belt, and so you know it distracts them right away, and they're like, oh, what are you doing? And um, so I talk about, okay, if I was going to build a doghouse, what would I need? You know, and they start listing up all these tools. And like, okay, so could I build a, a doghouse with just a saw? No, obviously not. Okay, so I'm going to have to use more than one tool. I'm going to have to use different kind of tools. 
Like, okay, so if I need to hook these two pieces of wood together, what could I use? Oh, okay, well, you could use a screw. And so I get a screw out, and, uh, and I do that in class, too. <laughs> and um, I uh, start putting this screw in here, and I get out my screwdriver, and screw it in. And I purposely make it so there's a little bit of a gap, and I'm like, okay, so is that working? Is that good? Yeah. I said, what, is it the way you want it? Because there's a gap in there. No, 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 no. I said, what else could I do then? What else would work to get this? Get well, you can nail it. Okay. Well, let's take out our screwdriver and try a nail. So then I hook my nail in and I hammer it. And, oh, wow. Did that work? Yeah, that worked really good. Okay. So then we talk about how, oh, so if one tool didn't work, what did we have to do? We had to use another tool. Right. It's just the same way when we're reading. And we make a list of all the strategies they know how to do when they come to a word that they don't know. And they can list off strategies. It's one thing the school's done really, those of you teachers that are teaching younger kids do really well, is teaching them things that they can do when they're stuck on words. So we have this list handy. And we're reading along, and they try to figure out the word, and usually the first thing they try is sounding it out. I'll let them try it twice. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, what are you going to have to do? Oh, I have to try a different strategy. Okay, look on the list and they find another strategy. Um, one sheet that I did with this that really, really helped them, um, very similar to the other one of the monitoring understanding, they wrote the word here that they were stuck on. And then we have all the strategies that they had brainstormed. And they check mark the one that they tried and they put a star next to the one that worked. So by the time they get this page filled in, then we have several words that they've been trying. And we can see, okay, I tried to sound it out every time, but I only have one star, okay? So it only worked one time. But um, so a lot of them chunking works great. So they chunked and, ooh, I have four stars. That's, that strategy works really well for me. Or um, skipping it, reading on it, coming back. Ooh, I have five stars there. That one is really good for me. So it helped the kids find out that some of those strategies, the strategies that they're doing all the time don't work well. They don't work well. And then they find out, oh, I didn't know that chunking was such a good strategy for me. So then they find out things that for them personally work well, and they are then able to uh, use strategies more effectively. Okay, that is it. And um, hopefully, if you guys don't teach these strategies, hopefully this thing can come up with some ideas of how you could teach something using another totally different object. And there are third grade teachers in here, so yeah. you can ask them secretly. So did it do anything for these kids at all? It does. It does. It does. But and they have fun. They enjoy it, and they do remember it. Yeah. They they seem to be. Oh, and Jessica's in here too. Sorry. But Jessica's too. So. They like it. Oh, and somebody else asked, can I use these? And I, I, yeah, I thought about, should I change these second